it's so nice not to just be sitting in front of my Zoom camera, uh, you know, as we do this, to have actual people there in the audience. And I see that we do have a large uh, audience on Zoom, so that is uh, great as well. So it's really, I hope everybody is savoring, as I am, this possibility of being back together. Uh, and I'm really, uh, you know, glad to come here. I bet there are a few folks, at least on the Zoom audience, who may well have been interviewees in our early studies of the practical advice of older people. Uh, and because almost all, you know, because we used both older faculty and, and emeritus faculty for those studies. So I, I will tell you a little bit about how I got here in a second, how I came from these kind of studies of older people and of more general family dynamics to the specific topic of family estrangement. But let me begin first with a story to frame this concept of estrangement, uh, it, because I, I'm sure there are some people who've experienced in your families, all of us know people who have experienced in their families, but so, so I'm going to frame it briefly, one phenomenon about this. So um, if you, uh, I, I'm sure all of you read the Winnie the Pooh stories when you were children. Uh, if you're of a certain age, you read them to your children and you read them to their, your grandchildren. Uh, and, and they're very beloved. And you all know that this is a story of a boy named Christopher Robin who has adventures and misadventures, which is quirky, eccentric, but lovable animal friends in the Hundred Acre Wood. You probably also know that uh, Christopher Robin was based on a real person. That is, he was a Christopher Robin Milne, who was the son of the author A.A. A. Milne. Uh, and that family, the mother went away in the summer, so he was left to occupy his young son. And that's, of course, the famous Pooh Bear, who I think now is in the British Museum. Um, he made up stories about his menagerie of stuffed animals and the beautiful wood around their house was, you know, became the hundred acre wood. So if you know this about this family, I'm sure many of us have an image of the warm and loving relationship that they must have had and how that carried throughout their lives. What most people don't know is that Christopher Robin Milne and his parents were estranged throughout their adult lives. Um, Christopher Robin Milne said at one point famously, my father climbed to success on the back of my infant shoulders and left me only with the empty fame of being his son. Um, he did not speak to his mother throughout most of his adult life, and she apparently felt the same way because she refused him a deathbed reconciliation when he requested it um, at the end of her life. Now, why don't you know this about this family? It, the answer to that is similar to why you don't know it about many people among your family and friends. Uh, because one of the first discoveries in doing this study is that in a world where anything goes and people are willing to talk about anything and document their lives for the public on camera, this is still a taboo topic. It's something that when you tell someone that you're estranged from your child or you never see your brother, People in this situation imagine a cartoon bubble over their head, the unspoken, well, what's wrong with you? So we, we encountered this over and over in estrangements. Now, well, one thing I wanted to say, I'm going to show you some videos. And these videos are exactly verbatim what interviewees said in their interviews. Uh, because most of our estrangements, though, were active. Other uh, people were not willing to be interviewed. So a team of professional actors immersed themselves in the stories, uh, uh, um, and you know, also actually able to hear the interviews and conveyed them. But uh, so that's what you'll be seeing. And so this was one of our interviewees who I think really summed up the sense of shame and isolation. And let's hope that the internet gods have the sound working. Five years ago, my husband and I were cut off completely by our daughter. And nothing we do makes any difference in getting back together with her. When we meet people, it is devastating to tell the truth. But we deal with it by being straightforward. Oh, there's problems, or we don't see each other. It's not a question that people ask more about. We were approached by neighbors, them saying, well, you're such nice people, why does this happen? We're labeled with a black cloud. 
the big thing that I would recommend to estranged people is to not feel that you are isolated in a corner. This is happening to lots of people. And it's important to share the news. Letting out the news is saying, you're not alone. This is happening to many families. And if we tell our story, they may say, we have it too. So this interviewee was very similar to other people, that there was this sense of a black cloud hanging over them. So, you know, as Joe said, I, one of the goals in this study the, was to take this problem out of the shadows, as he, as he you know, quoted me, and, and more into the clear light of discussion. So people, and, and, so people would more easily be able to engage in talking about it and tell other people about it. Um, and that does seem to have happened at least a little bit as a result of the book. Um, I want to say just a word about how I got here. Um, a lot of my research over the years has been around family conflict. So I do aging related work, but also work on the family. So I've looked at conflict and abuse in families. I've studied the abuse of older people. Uh, but we've looked at families under stress, in particular families and the stress of caregiving and conflicts that, that arise among siblings, for example, around caring for their parents. We, we, we've done a series of studies on parental favoritism in later life. So older parents differentially treating their, their adult children and what happens. And we've done a series of studies on ambivalence. So, you know, the feeling about one's family members that, you know, can't live with them, can't live without them. So I was primed to be thinking about this kind of issue. But what really happened, what really got me onto this topic was a signature event. So in the first book, in that first study of the Legacy Project, we were interviewing people around the country uh, in their 70s, 80s, 90s, and beyond about their lessons for living. And one of the questions we asked was, how can a young person get to your age and not have any regrets? One thing people did tell us is if you get to 100 and have no regrets, you probably haven't lived that interesting a life. So, you know, there is, a, there is that issue. But in general, we asked them, what do they regret and how could young people avoid it? So I expected a lot of big ticket items, uh, you know, an affair, a shady business deal. I wasn't prepared for how many very old people, an unresolved estrangement in their life, that was such a critical issue for them. Uh, it, the, with a parent, when their parent was still alive, with siblings, and especially with their own uh, children. And there was one person in particular I talk about in the book who brought home to me in her 80s how this was such an enduring problem. Uh, and that really got me into the study. So one mystery which occurred is I, like a good social scientist or scientist of any kind, began to look at the literature and I realized some uh, things about it. All up. Um, one is it was clear just from talking to people that estrangement affects millions of people, that it's, it seems to be quite widespread. Certainly, if you're following, uh, um, as to the second point, if you're following the royal funeral, pages and pages of press coverage have been devoted to William and Henry, Wa I mean, uh, you know, uh, with the William and, um, what's his name, Harry, um, walking together at, you know, the funeral uh, so that the estrangement is, is, is frequently in the media. But um, surprisingly little guidance exists. There's actually almost no self-help literature about this. Uh, and what was particularly striking was how little research there was on it. So that when I started this study, I would say there were fewer than 10 referee journal articles on the topic. Now it's around 20. So it really hasn't increased in scholarly interest, even in the family therapy literature. And uh, those studies which are done rely on small and unrepresentative samples. So this was like raw meat to a starving wolf or something. You know, this seems, you know, there's nothing that one likes better than a widespread but under-researched um, um, a phenomenon. And so that got me uh, into this. I'll just say a brief word about the methods. And, and if folks are interested, they're actually described in an appendix to the book. But so just to point out that even though I made the unusual choice of not 
publishing a bunch of academic or you know articles before writing a book about it. And the reason for that was the topic was so complex and nuanced and there was so much qualitative data that it was hard to slice it and dice it into articles. Now we're actually doing that more. But um, so one thing um, um, in terms of what estrangement is, in the limited literature, people talk about emotional estrangement or sometimes equate a kind of low level distancing or conflict with estrangement. I really argue that this is a different phenomenon, a, a phenomenon in which somebody cuts off contact as completely as you can do in this interconnected world and uh, with one or more relatives. It's a real sense, as many respondents said, I'm done, I never wanna to speak to you or hear from you again. And, and I'll come back with another definition. So to keep what I'm going to tell you right now briefly straight, I, I have to distinguish between two studies. One was a study using a national web-based panel um, with, and I could describe it more methodologically to get an initial prevalence figure. Um, and that involved 1,350 uh, individuals. Uh, the other was a national um, uh, in-depth interview study. Excuse me, yes, so it was an in-depth interview study largely through snowball sampling and convenience sampling when we accumulated people who had been in this situation. So yes, as I noted, it was a national survey of representative that mirrored the US population of 1,340 Americans uh, and was based on an aggregated web panel. Um, and we conducted around 300 very long and very detailed in-depth interviews for qualitative researchers among you, this is really large, but, but we really wanted uh, the wisdom of crowds. So we wanted enough interviewees of all kinds of relationships and situations um, so we could saturate the themes that we heard. Now in this, really interestingly, I was able to acquire the largest sample of people who had successfully reconciled. So that around 200 of these folks were in intractable or long-term estrangements, or at least were currently in one. But through special recruitment techniques, we were able to talk to 100 people who had had often as bad a relationship early on in their lives, but somehow had managed to reconcile. I was greatly helped by our local the celebrity um, Amy Dickinson of Ask Amy, who some of you know lives in Freeville, who announced in her column very nicely that we were looking for people who had reconciled. And so that was a big help. So I went through a shift in focus where I started out this study. It was about estrangement. I was focusing on estrangement and I began to get really depressed. I began to be drawn into these really challenging and problematic narratives and started to feel like, what am I going to write about? And I had a revelation, an aha moment, talking to one woman who first began by describing what really was a Dickensian childhood. Uh, her parents were local, her father was a local drug dealer. Uh, her mother abandoned the family. She was a force to deliver drugs and help him sell drugs as an early adolescent. She was mistreated physically by him and sexually by other men in their lives. And the mother abandoned the family. So I expected to hear the same narrative. No, I never see them again. But instead, she had successfully reconciled with both of them. Um, and in her early 40s, they were in her life and had relationships uh, with her children. And I'll come back to this, but one of the themes that emerged through this interview was what a powerful engine for personal growth this process of reconciliation had been for her. And even though the relationships were imperfect, it still had been one of the most worthwhile things that she had ever done in her life. And I'll come back to those themes. But so that got me to think, I need a bunch of people who have actually gotten through this. Uh, and that led to a really intensive, obviously there's no database of people who's re who've reconciled the, with their families. So the idea of throughout this whole project, as in my previous two popular, you know, two trade books, has been when there's an intractable or really difficult human problem, can we tap the, and there's little scientific evidence, because so we should follow the science if we can, 
can we tap the wisdom of people who've successfully resolved a problem and distill that information um, and make it available to other people? So when I talk about findings and advice, this is not my own. It's from analyzing you know, these interviews about how people either stayed in estrangements or overcame them and what characterizes situations where reconciliation occurs. So I'd like to touch on four things here. One is the question of how much estrangement is there. So is it one of these media overblown modern epidemics that you hear so much about, or is it really a highly prevalent problem? Uh, how do people get there? And I'll just be brief about that. I wanna mention the, the effects of estrangement and why it is as profoundly difficult for people and why it constitutes what we public health and social science folks would call a chronic stress. Uh, and then I'd like to spend more of the time on how did people who reconciled get there and what advice do they have for others? So in terms of how much, how much estrangement there is, um, this was the exact uh, survey question. Do, do you have any family members? And these are the two important points. From whom you are currently estranged, meaning you have no contact with them at the present time. So we wanted to be conservative in that we wanted people to identify themselves as estranged. So it's not just that my brother's moved you know, to Bangladesh and it's hard to get in touch with him, but the person says, yes, I am estranged and that they have as close as possible, no contact. So, you know, I should almost ask you, if you think about it, you know, how many people do you think would say yes to this question? Numbers don't always speak to themselves, but I was really surprised to find that over a quarter um, of the US population has an active estrangement from somebody. And that even if you limit, it's not on the slide, but even if you limited that to people who said, this has occurred to me and I'm somewhat upset about it. So if you drop the people who say, yes, I have this estrangement, but I don't care, it only drops it by four or 5%. It's still basically one in five people say, I'm estranged from someone in my family and that is upsetting to me. So, um, and you can see the subgroups, but. Uh, the estrangements were typically from parents or children or siblings. Um, a number of people in that other category are often estranged from the entire other side of the family. It's not just a single uh, individual. And so the answer is how much estrangement is there? It seems like there's a lot. Uh, and because of the ripple effects through families and the social desirability bias of not admitting to this, um, it could be even higher. Now, you know, it's really nice to talk to people who are more or less my age because we have the same cultural reference points. But if you remember the movie, if it's Tuesday, it must be Belgium, the, like about, you know, the one day a country uh, tour, but that's what this is going to be like. I'm just going to, I deal with it extensively in the book, but there are basically six major pathways uh, that we found. I wouldn't say causes it precisely, but life course pathways uh, that all lead to this same outcome. One is that there are people for whom a legacy of harsh parenting, of child abuse is impossible to get over. And many of those people are the ones who are least likely to reconcile. And some therapists would say that it's not in their interest to reconcile if their childhood has been extraordinarily traumatic and certainly if there's still some danger. So one point in this talk and in the book is that reconciliation certainly isn't for everyone if there are situations that are too damaging or difficult. But even if it wasn't that extreme, parental favoritism, extreme sibling rivalry, these seem to sort of lead in a pathway or could towards estrangement. It may surprise no one to know that divorce is a factor in a number of estrangements, especially from children and their fathers who are much more likely to go on, start other families and become detached from the family. Uh, the problematic in-law uh, was another factor. So um, someone marries the wrong person or the family perceives that they've married the wrong person or they marry someone who deliberately estranges them or moves them away from the family. Uh, so in-law relationships factor in. Money may not be the root of all evil, but it is the root of a surprising number of uh, estrangements. And I'm doing some work now with um, 
Cornell's Family Business Institute and with Bank of America's Wealth Management and a couple of other places who see this happen a lot when people are leaving to their heirs indivisible goods like a summer home uh, or artworks or that kind of thing, how difficult, how much that can split families. Value and lifestyle differences, political ones obviously may occur, uh, but also uh, disagreements about, it, it's not a lifestyle difference, but say sexual orientation, uh, religious conversion, other kinds of value and lifestyle differences. Um, and finally, expectations. And there's a phrase that runs around the internet called expectations or disappointments waiting to happen. Um, and that is, is uh, really correct in this case, that we have such high expectations for family members. One area I'll come back to that this was very obvious in is among siblings when a parent becomes ill and the siblings who may not have had that much to do with one another in midlife have to come together and deal with that. You know, people expect your siblings to do something in that case. And when they don't, it can lead to a, um, a cutoff of contact. Um, it, there were some cross-cutting themes. Any of you who've talked to someone, who've heard someone describe an estrangement they're in, may have registered surprise at how many people identify a specific incident as a trigger. So, you know, they did, and these are real from the study. My husband wasn't asked to give a toast at the wedding and I haven't talked to my daughter for two years. Um, that sort of a thing, you know, I didn't get the family grandfather clock, which had been promised to me by my father. Uh, it was not, he forgot to put it in the will and my sister who was the executor wouldn't give it to me. I haven't spoken to her for 10 years. What we learned in this, of course, is that these signature events, these transformative relational experiences do have a very long history. Um, and people who reconciled often got over the event and worked back through it. Uh, the role of others, others play a role in two ways. Other um, people or family members can promote the estrangement. So in the book, there was more than one case of say a sister is trying to reach out to her father and her siblings are outraged that she would ever want to talk to him again. Or there are sometimes though when others promote a reconciliation. So a person's, you know, a man is estranged from, from his father and mother. Uh, you know, they have grandchildren and his wife says, I would like to have our children know their grandparents. So others play a role. C collateral damage is very powerful in this, that estrangements rarely affect one person. Families regroup and they take sides. Uh, and there is collateral damage um, down generations. So a number of people in the book, uh, when there's a rift, say in our generation, cousins stop talking to one another. Um, they become estranged from entire sides of the family. So there's a lot of collaborative dam uh, collateral damage. And finally, a cross-cutting theme. So we tend to think of estrangement as resulting from anger and hostility. Um, and one finding of this study is consistent with some family therapy research. Uh, there's a school of family therapy that I talk about in the book that's really interesting called Bowen theory or Bowen family therapy, B-O-W-E-N. And for anyone listening who's interested in, in talking with a counselor about this, it's the only school of family therapy that really addresses estrangement or what they call cut off directly. One thing which they find in their clinical work and which I found in this study is many estrangements don't resolve because there's this underlying anxiety, anxiety at being pulled back into a troubling family situation, being thrown back into an old role in the family, being criticized or belittled. So that often for people who reconciled, they either through counseling or therapy or some other process overcame the anxiety. And finally, I just wanna say a word here about um, estrangement as a chronically stressful experience. And then I'll move on to reconciliation. Uh, rather than being a single event, so, you know, stress for all of us. So we respond to stress. You know, you step out in the street and a car almost hits you and your heart beats for a while and then you're back to normal. Uh, but a lot of the problems people have in life that have mental and physical health con consequences are these situations where you're in a chronically stressed situation. And that's the case in long-term estrangements. Sort of never goes away. 
There are periods where a reconciliation might be possible, but then it's pulled away. There, it, it becomes a chronic issue. And it was best described, I think, by one of our you know, respondents who I think told very graphically what this was like for her. Oh, space bar. I have a scar on my chest from heart surgery. Okay, it healed, it's a scar. But the estrangement from my daughter, it's an open wound. Every day I have to wrap myself, insulate myself. I have to protect myself because it's an open wound. I can't, I can't fix it. I can't change it. It's still there every day. It's, it's the death of a relationship with no funeral, no closure. I can't recover from it. I, I can't recover from that. And this respondent had been from an immigrant family where there was a lot of expectations of family closeness. So that was, that was um, somewhat typical. By the way, you know, we, just a process comment, we sort of wound up losing around 15 minutes or so. I don't know how many people have a hard stop. I'm gonna still try to stay within uh, 45 minutes, but. Um, so three things about why it's so stressful. One is broken attachments. So we think of just relationships in the present moment, but in our family of origin, there's been you know, 80 years of research on attachment theory that we become irrationally attached to people who we grow up with through basic biological processes that unfold in families. So over and over in interviews, I would have people say, no, really, this is fine. I mean, this thing with my mother, I just couldn't stand her. And, th and then maybe three quarters of the way through the interview, they were in tears or nearly so, talking about why it was so difficult. It's extremely rare, almost never occurred in our studies that this was just a great thing, the best thing I've ever done. And one reason for that is this, you know, are these uh, processes of attachment. Um, um, a second reason why it's so stressful is there's been a lot of recent research in psychology about interpersonal rejection and looking at it as, and it, uh, they found that it's one of the most stressful experiences. So on a scale of life course, of life events that, that can happen to you, direct rejection is extraordinarily painful. People ruminate about it, have difficulty getting over it. Um, and, and estrangement involves in most cases, a sense of rejection. But finally, the other reason why it's so challenging for people are how uncertain it is. So there's a wonderful uh, family therapist and psychological researcher named Pauline Boss. And, um, um, and she created a term I wish I had created called ambiguous loss. So her early studies were in families where a spouse was a prisoner of war or, or had gone missing in action. And so the person was psychologically present but physically absent and you didn't know when they were ever gonna come back. It's actually been used with people caring for someone with dementia who maybe is physically present, but the person isn't there. Um, and estrangement forms this kind of ambiguous loss that where the person's there, the relationship could be rekindled, but they are no longer present and where the whole situation is even frozen in time. So that's another piece of it. Well, so let me move on to what were the pathways to reconciliation? When people decided, you know, got into a, a, a contemplation stage that I would like this estrangement to end, either as the person who initiated it or, or the person who was affected by it, you know, how did they get there? Um, and I'm going to give you four, three or four main points. So, which which is distilling from these interviews in as convenient of uh, um, a way as I can what people did. And let me assure you one thing. If I were to give you the family histories blinded of people who reconciled and people who didn't, 
you would find almost no difference. It's not like these were the only difference. There may have been a lower proportion of individuals who really had experienced you know, seriously abusive childhoods. But even in those cases, some people reconcile. So one of the key things people advised is that you have to live life forward in this case. And the reason for that is all of us have family narratives and there's a long standing history of research on this. And we become extremely attached to our narratives about what happened in our families. Uh, and we tell other people those narratives and we find our own family allies who reinforce those. So almost nothing at age 50 is gonna change the viewpoints of Tom who believes that his brother was a sadist in their childhood and Bill who believes he was doing ordinary everyday teasing. Um, or that, you know, dad was never with the family and didn't care and dad believing he was just working to keep food on the table. So people gave up those narratives, often very good, but with great um, difficulty. They often abandoned demanding an apology, which by the way, I found in estrangement that when people want an apology, it's not for an event. It's for the entire person the other person is or for one's entire childhood. And, and so usually apologies don't work that well. Now, I want to show you, this is, you know, like again, direct, exactly what happened in the interviews. I had a fascinating experience as part of this book. I was able to go with a son who had had no contact. He was in his fifties, mid fifties had had no contact with his mother for 25 years. So he was going to see her again um, for the first time. And I was able to get invited along. And while I was there, I interviewed both of them. Uh, and there was a sister who'd maintained some contact with the mother, but only a little and, and kind of grudgingly. Um, and I think this really shows the, the challenge why, why people have to give up these past narratives in order to reconcile. I feel like I've done everything I can to show that I'm a loving, caring parent. But my kids don't seem to think so. None of this makes sense to me. I mean, I always ask myself, what part was abusive they went to good schools. They did extracurricular activities. There was always good food on the table. Where's the disconnect here? You know, we didn't have alcoholism. We didn't have physical abuse. We didn't have any of that in our family. They don't have any reality check here. And if the parent tries to bring in that side, it's just, no, you're negative and a toxic parent. Instead of the reality. When we were growing up, she lied all the time. She's manipulative. After about age 25, I just didn't want anything to do with her. Neither did my sister, but she was more tolerant of her than I was. I had just had enough. If you met her, you'd think she was nice. But everything was in service to her needs. She wasn't like a normal mother. Yes, she was involved with us, but she was so narcissistic. You just get so tired of it. The reality of our lives was that she put us in the hands of an emotionally abusive stepfather, and then she detached herself from that reality. Um, actually, this family was the mother um, after this had um, um, uh, ill health problems and a, a sort of a reconciliation did occur. But 
um, I, I guess because I have kept in touch with some of these interviewees. However, in this case, what's so striking is this notion of reality, that other people can't see the reality, that, it, that they can't see what's actually going on. So in most cases, there was this sense of letting go of it, of not demanding an apology and moving forward. I just in interest of time, I'm gonna skip a bit. So another, um, um, a second uh, powerful piece of advice was, Rec was examining one's own role and not taking the blame for it, but at least exploring what one's role in the estrangement was. And I discovered you know, this fascinating literature in psychology as I was trying to think this out on defensiveness and of what happens when people get a defensive. And since estrangement typically involves an attack on your identity, so you've invested massive amounts of time as a parent, say, and you want the reward in later life and your child is denying you any access. It's such an attack on one's own identity and sense of self uh, that people become very, very defensive. And one of the things I noticed among estranged parents, and I call it in the book, a defensive ignorance and siblings as well, but it was most prominent among estranged parents, is, you would, is we would interview them and they would say routinely, I have no idea why this happened. Literally, I don't have any idea. You know, she won't talk to me. She got angry one day. And then if you look through the interview transcript, the, uh, the person reports a very long history of conflict, of difficulty, not liking the son-in-law, not approving of job choices. Um, you know, even as dramatic as um, the mistakenly sending an incredibly critical email to the entire family about the child after whom, I mean, God, the, the role that social media plays in these estrangements is really, so, and then they would come back and say, but I have no idea why this happened. So we coined the term defensive ignorance. And even in those situations, and this was in, in existing estrangements, you would say, well, now, you know, like, let me, you know, read back to you, you've described this, and the person would then say, I, yeah, I still just don't know why this happened. Part of it is, especially among people in their 70s and older, you know, having grown up a, a, with a sense of that you stick with your family no matter what, they didn't anticipate that relational problems that would end it. And so I think that is one, uh, that's a key piece. Um, another one is the notion of eliminating expectations, the, which I touched on earlier. These expectations that families have that siblings should always have your back or children should support their parents had to be reevaluated in order to reconcile. Um, and let me uh, you know, give you one last um, um, example. This was a situation where, and, and there were a number of these, where a sibling had simply not come through in a caregiving situation uh, and led to various problems, uh, but also this was one where it led to reconciliation as well. When my brother was needed to help care for my parents, he just couldn't do it. I mean, these are your parents. They're not strangers. These are people who have cared for you and taken care of you for the vast majority of your life. Where are you? <laughs> so I cut off all contact with him. But as time went on, I couldn't sustain my anger. I wanted to at least be able to get along at holidays when we had to be in the same room. I realized that he would never be able to live up to my values. I don't think he has a lot of depth or the ability to understand my situation as the main caregiver. So I decided that you have to accept the limitations within other people. He is not a bad person. It doesn't do me any good to expect these things from him because they're just not there. And finally, uh, you know, before we you know, wrap up, the notion of setting uh, boundaries is, is a cliche now almost, right? We all have to have boundaries at work. We have to have boundaries between um, work and family, et cetera. And uh, the people who had successfully reconciled have discovered something a little different. 
almost no one could re-enter these relationships without a very strong sense of new boundaries. That there had to be some kind of agreement, some kind of movement in the relationship that was going to protect the person who had started the estrangement from experiencing the problems. Again, what tended to happen was what I call in the book offering one last chance or setting even more than boundaries, clear terms. So a number of people who reconciled, you know, decided sometimes after therapy or with help from supportive others that they were going to give it another try with their sibling, child, once close cousin, parent, grandparent. And they laid out extraordinarily clear terms. So one example would be this. There, a, a woman became estranged. She remarried in later life, became estranged from her daughter, and uh, was shut out completely of the family's life. And she had not been an easy person to live with. Her daughter said to her, all right, you can come and see us and see your grandchildren, but here's exactly what has to happen. You can come once every two months. You can't stay with us. You can't bring your second husband. You can never refer to your second husband in the presence of me or my family or my children. Um, and you cannot um, criticize my parenting or criticize my husband. That's the deal. Uh, and in this case, the mother said yes. In some cases, when these opportunities were offered, people just couldn't do it. I profile two sisters in the book who actually went to therapy together, set ground rules, and decided to remain estranged because these last chances didn't work. Uh, but over and over, they, this was you know, highly successful for people. And often the estrangement had frightened the other relative enough, or it was so shocking that, that they were willing to change uh, the relationship. So the final thing I wanna say, I sometimes get, you know, have gotten asked, and it's why I added this point, um, in interviews say, what was the most surprising thing? And I'm going to say a caveat in case, you know, um, as a recording is viewed, I think I've been accused of being overly pro-reconciliation uh, pro in these cases. So I want to make the point that there are cases where, you know, people shouldn't reconcile and it's a purely individual decision. That said, I was struck by how many of the hundred people who had been estranged and reconciled found it to be one of the most important developmental experiences of their life. Even if the relationship was imperfect, you know, the process of working through it and analyzing themselves and dealing with the situation and um, um, learning how to set boundaries and how to protect themselves in these challenging relationships, in addition to often getting practical uh, gains from it, like being able to attend family gatherings, you know, being being brought back into a family mutual support system, though we're so positive that you know uh, there was no one who went through the reconciliation process, not one out of a hundred who said, "I wish I hadn't done this." And I want to end with a quote because um, it really sums it up. Uh, the person said, "I would advise someone else, don't do what I did and wait ten years to heal your relationship." Whether you're the person that the estrangement happened to or you're the person who created it, you're both victims and it's gonna take one of you to make it happen. When you are successful at reconciling, it's almost like a rebirth. It's an awakening and you become a new person, an energized, strong person, and you can take on the world. If you could take this on and reconcile, you can take on the world. And that sounds a little overblown, but it is a lot of what I heard from people. So, uh, you know, the, uh, I think uh, one of the morals of the story, and again, not for everybody, if you're considering reconciling and can do it uh, with support and help, I'd say the findings of our research are to give it a try. And if someone offers you the opportunity to reconcile, it's often good to say yes, uh, and to work through some of these issues. So uh, we do have a website, which is um, familyreconciliation.org, uh, where we take new stories, especially of reconciliation. Um, and the book is Fault Lines, which don't buy it now because it's, it's gonna finally come out in paperback um, and be a lot cheaper uh, um, soon after.